All right, first up we have Banish from Edoras. And, and please keep in mind that I'm probably going to butcher some of these Tolkien names uh, here. I haven't read the books in a really long time. I haven't watched the movies in a really long time. Um, so there's a lot of Tolkien specific names that I might absolutely butcher here. So please give me some grace. Uh, I will try my best. So Banish from Edoras is four and a white for a sorcery. This spell costs two colorless less to cast if it targets a tapped creature and it exiles target creature. So for three mana, exile something that's not terrible. It's also uh, a common, so you're going to draft this a lot. Um, I'm excited for the draft format of Lord of the Rings because there's some interesting synergies going on. Um, you know, three mana to exile tapped creature is, is not too bad. It's not too bad. Next up, we have the Battle of Bywater. One white white for a sorcery. Destroy all creatures with power three or greater. Then create a food token for each creature you control. Okay, so there's... Uh, the Tooks marched in with Pippin at, at their head. Mary now had enough sturdy hobbitry to deal with the ruffians. Uh, so this is really interesting because the hobbits are obviously a big part of Lord of the Rings. And they're all smaller creatures. So, And they also care about food tokens. So destroying everything with power three or greater is pretty cool. Uh, then create a food token for each creature you control. This is super overpowered for one white white. Um, this is a huge, huge board wipe uh, with potential to, you know, fully snowball a game if your deck cares about food tokens. Um, big, big plays. Uh, next up we have uh, Bill the Pony. Three and a white for a legendary creature horse with one power for toughness. When Bill the Pony enters the battlefield, create two food tokens. And then you can sacrifice a food until end of turn. Target creature you control assigns combat damage equal to its toughness rather than its power. That's pretty good. Bill the Pony's got a big booty. Uh, take that out of context if you wish. Um... This will be really cool in the white green decks because there's a lot of tree folks, as you can imagine, in the Lord of the Rings set. So having something that assigns toughness as combat damage it is a big deal for tree folk. Build a Pony seems like a really cool addition. Next up, we have Boromir, Warden of the Tower, our first titular character. Uh, two and a white for a legendary creature, human soldier, 3-3 three, three, with vigilance. When an opponent casts a spell, if no mana was spent to cast it, counter that spell. So nobody gets stuff for free. Sacrifice Boromir. Creatures you control gain indestructible until end of turn, and the ring tempts you. So the ring tempting you is, um, is a new mechanic that has a bunch of different stages. I don't think that there is a placeholder card. I'm assuming that in each pack or in some random packs, you're going to get explanation cards of like what it looks like when the ring tempts you. Um, I'm just scrolling on Scryfall really quickly to see if it's listed on here. So one thing that was really interesting about the ring tempting you is that there doesn't really seem to be that obvious of a downside other than some cards um some cards are stronger against the ring bearers versus non-ring bearers so it's interesting yeah there's nothing there um it's interesting to see it will be interesting to see how big of an impact the ring tempting you is because from what I remember reading on the card, the instruction, um, it's all upside. So it's very difficult to kind of judge from where we're sitting right now as to whether or not the ring tempting you is going to be a major play. Kind of like uh, Monarch. Monarch kind of seemed, uh, or Enter the Dungeons even, those, those kind of secondary goals always seem really soft in previews and then once you get playing and once you you test those decks and and get to play with those mo mechanics more people start to build around it and aim for it and it becomes something that's uh, rather sought after at the table so it's really interesting to to know oh they're reprinting all the um 
drowned catacombs and choked estuary and all those ones. That's cool. Sorry, I'm getting distracted. I'm looking for the ring tempting you card. It's not here. What the heck? Uh, the ring tempts you card rules. Uh, well, we can move on. We can maybe bring it up. Um, oh, there we go. Save image. You can jump over here. So this is the ring tempting you. Um, each time the ring tempts you, it continues to go down this list, kind of like a level up mechanic. Uh, the ring bearer is legendary and can't be blocked by creatures with greater power. Uh, whenever your ring bearer attacks, draw a card, then discard. Whenever your ring bearer becomes blocked by a creature, that creature's controller sacrifices it at the end of combat. And whenever the, your ring bearer deals combat damage to a player, each opponent loses three life. So just right out the gate, it is not a negative whatsoever. Um, very positive. So stuff that says the ring tempts you on here is going to be, you know, highly sought after, I think. Uh, moving on, we've got Dawn of a New Age. One and a white for an enchantment, a mythic enchantment. Dawn of the new of a new age enters the battlefield with a hope counter on it for each creature you control. At the beginning of your end step, remove a hope counter from Dawn of a New Age. If you do, draw a card. Then, if Dawn of a New Age has no hope counters on it, sacrifice it and gain four life. So it enters... Oh, it enters with depending on how many creatures you have. Okay, so you could pay two. If you have three creatures on board, say like turn three or turn four, you pay two mana, play this enchantment, you get three card draws, um, and then eventually you gain four life. So it's, again, all upside. Uh, it's a cheap investment. The biggest downside is that you can't activate it at any time. It's simply just at the uh, beginning of your end step. So someone with enchantment removal could easily take this away from you. Very intriguing, um, nice and cheap, but pretty powerful enchantment there. Next up, we have Dune, Dune Dane, Dwin Dane Blade. Again, apologies to all the Tolkienites out there that I'm going to butcher these Tolkien words. Um, the Dwin Dane Blade is a one and a white for an artifact equipment. Equipped creature gets plus two plus one. Equip human is one, and equipped normal any other creature is three. So this wants to be attached to humans, um, which makes sense because I believe this is Aragorn's sword. I'm not 100% certain on that. Nice little piece of equipment. Plus two, plus one. It's not bad. Next up, we have Eagles of the North. Ah, yes. The titular eagles that did not just end the movies. Five and a white for a creature bird soldier 3-3 three, three, with flying. When Eagles of the North enter the battlefield, creatures you control get plus one, plus oh, and gain first strike until end of turn. And it has plane cycling, so you can cycle it for one and find a planes card in your deck. Actually, I, I like that they're bringing the, the land cycling back. I think that's really powerful. Next up, we have Ur East Farthing Farmer. What a tongue twister. Uh, two and a white for a creature halfling peasant. Two, three. Whenever Earth far East Farthing Farmer enters the battlefield, create a food token. When you do, target creature you control gets plus one, plus one till end of turn for each food token you control. That's that could be pretty big. That could get out of hand real fast. Um, very interesting. Next up, we have Eastmark Cavalier. One and a white for a 2-2 human knight creature with vigilance. Whenever Eastmark Cavalier deals damage to a goblin or orc, destroy that creature. So we got a little species prejudice going on here. This is strong against goblins and orcs. Very neat. Uh, next up, we have Ewan 
Ewen, E U E O E O N, E O N, Lady of Rohan, two and a white for a two four legendary creature, human noble. At the beginning of combat on your turn, target creature gains your choice of first strike or vigilance until end of turn. If that creature is equipped, it gains first strike and vigilance until end of turn instead. Equipped abilities you activate cost one less to activate. So not a huge win. Um, obviously giving equipped creatures first strike and vigilance is really strong. But there's a lot of great equipment out there that's already doing a mix of some of those things. The equipment ability activation cost uh, discount is only one colorless. Uh, not very good. Um, but this is, again, like looking at the rarity on this card, it's only an uncommon. This is not a headliner whatsoever. This is simply just something you put in addition to your deck. God, that's so cold. It catches me off guard every time. Next up, we have Aaron Rider of Gondor. Two and a white for a 3-2 human soldier creature. When Errand Rider of Gondor enters the battlefield, draw a card. Then if you don't control a legendary creature, put a card from your hand on the bottom of your library. Interesting. So you play this after you've played a legendary creature, which is pretty cool. You get that free card draw and no downside if you just have a legendary creature on the battlefield already. Pretty neat. Uh, next up, we have Escape from Orthank. Orthonk. One white for an instant. Target creature gets plus one, plus three, and gains flying until end of turn. Untap it. Something that happened um, with Shore Up in the Dominar United set was that Blue got a instant uh untapping ability for one mana and this is really cool to see kind of the same thing happen in white here uh esquire of the king one white for a one one uh, human soldier creature it has no basic abilities and then it has an activated ability of four and a white tap it creatures you control get plus one plus one until end of turn this ability costs two less to activate if you control a legendary creature so obviously you want your um, human soldier army to be led by legendary characters. Very neat little kind of flavor win there. Next up we have Faramir, Field Commander. Three and a white for a 3-3 legendary creature, human soldier. Would trigger all those other legendary abilities. At the beginning of your end step, if a creature died under your control this turn, draw a card. Whenever the ring tempts you, if you choose a creature other than Faramir as your ring bearer, create a 1-1 white human soldier creature. So Faramir does not want the ring, period. Look at that face. That is the face of a coward. Next up we have Flowering of the White Tree. I saw this one getting a little bit of buzz online. Flowering of the White Tree is white white for a legendary enchantment. Legendary creatures you control get plus two, plus one, and have ward one. And non-legendary creatures you control get plus one, plus one. So this is just an anthem for two mana that gets better if your creatures are legendary. That's pretty insane. Um, it's not game-breaking, but it's very, very strong. Uh, next up, we have Fog on the Barrow Dens. Downs. Fog on the Barrow Downs. Two and a white for an enchantment aura, enchant creature. Enchant creature is a spirit and can't attack or block. Damn. You just pull them under and keep them there. Uh, next up we have forge anew, two and a white for an enchantment. When forge anew enters the battlefield, return target equipment card from your graveyard to the battlefield. Nice. As long as it's your turn, you may activate equip abilities anytime you can cast an instant. Damn, that's, that's cool. Uh, you may pay zero rather than pay the equip cost of the first equip ability you activate during each of your turns. Oof, that's a very strong equipment dex um, addition. Forge Anew is going to do some work, I promise you that. Uh, next up we have Frodo Sauron's Bane, our first main character here. Uh, one white for a 1-2 legendary creature halfling citizen. 
uh, for a white black or a white black, if Frodo Sauron's Bane is a citizen, it becomes a halfling scout with base power and toughness 2, 3, and lifelink. So you level him up. And then for three black, because Frodo kind of go, goes a little dark in the end, um, if Frodo is a scout, it becomes a halfling rogue with whenever this creature deals combat damage to a player, that player loses the game if the ring has tempted you four or more times this game. Otherwise, the ring tempts you. So that's a pretty cool one mana for a potential alternate win con is really, really strong. I think Frodo is a really, really cool card. I like these level up mechanics too. They've been doing it quite a bit um, with some of the sets recently. And I think this one's really cool. So you pay one to cast him. He's a one, two, which is pretty good. Having two toughness is, is pretty strong. Then you pay two mana to make him a 2-3 scout with lifelink. And then you pay three mana to make him a rogue with this game ending ability and ring tempting. Which is pretty cool. I like that card. Next up we have Gandalf the White, the first of the big wizards. Uh, three white white for a 4-5 avatar wizard legendary creature with flash oh you may cast legendary spells and artifact spells as though they had flash if a legendary permanent or artifact entering or leaving the battlefield causes a triggered ability of a permanent you control to trigger that ability triggers an additional time so he doubles up he's basically um elish norn but with the added benefit of flashing but it also doesn't like stop your opponent's ETB triggers from happening. It's just your stuff, which is interesting. That's an interesting kind of design scape. Oh, instead of, you know, inst instead of just changing the way Elish Norn interacts, it just takes half of it because Gandalf the White is more a, of a, an own team player versus a both sides player. That's pretty cool. I like that. Next up, we have Hobbit Sting. One and a white for an instant. Hobbit Sting deals X damage to target creature, where X is the number of creatures you control plus the number of foods you control. So for two, if you're playing white weenies in the Hobbit's deck, there's going to be a lot of small creatures. Um, they all sort of have something to do with food. Like you could pay two mana and potentially do like 10 damage to something. That seems kind of bonkers. You could kill almost anything for two mana. Um, yeah. Next up we have Landraval Horizon Witness. Four and a white for a three, four legendary creature bird noble with flying. Whenever two or more creatures you control attack a player Target attacking creature without flying gains flying until end of turn. Meh. That's kind of cool, but it's kind of it's kind of just soft. It's a, it's a subpar, I think. Next up, we have Lost to Legend. Oh, look at this art. That's so cool. Sorry, I'm like you can see my cursor on my background there. Um, that art is really gorgeous. White, white for an instant. Put target non-land historic permanent into its owner's library forth from the top. So you get to bounce something important uh, to your opponent. Put it forth from the top. Sometimes they never get to see it. Sometimes they have to wait and it's kind of ruined by then and they don't need it. That's a pretty cool little instant, especially for two white mana. You can bounce something before they use it. Uh, very, very neat. Next up, we have Nimble Hobbit. One and a white for a 1-3 creature, Halfling Peasant. Whenever Nimble Hobbit attacks, you may sacrifice a food or pay two and a white. When you do, tap target creature and opponent controls. So you get to tap things down if you sack a food or pay three mana. You're never going to want to pay three mana. That's way too much. Way too much. Next up, we have Now for Wrath, Now for Ruin, which I'm assuming is a quote from the book. 
I can't remember it. Uh, three and a white for a sorcery. Put a 1-1 one, one counter on each creature you control. They all gain vigilance until end of turn, and the ring tempts you. It's a bit of a steep cost for one, just a 1-1 one, one counter and vigilance, but it does put an actual counter on everything, and the ring tempts you, so obviously getting the ring to tempt you as many times as you can um, is something that you want to do. Uh, where are we? There we are. Protector of Gondor. Three and a white for a 3-3 creature human soldier. When Protector of Gondor enters the battlefield, create a 1-1 one, one white human soldier creature token. Not bad. A 3-3 three, three that makes a 1-1, one, one, so you're getting 4-4. Four, four. You're getting 4 power, 4 toughness for 4 mana. That's par, if not a little bit below par. A reprieve, I believe reprieve is a reprint, so this is this is a good reprint. One and a white for a instant. Return target spell to its owner's hand to draw a card. So you get to bounce something, which is normally not something white actually does. Um, but bouncing something is really good. And, and you get to draw a card for two mana at instant speed. Pretty solid card. Next up we have Rosy Cotton of South Lane. This is so adorable. Look at those happy little kidlets. Two and a white for a 1-1 one, one legendary creature halfling peasant. Three mana for a 1-1. One, one. When Rosy of Cot Rosy Cotton enters the battlefield, create a food token. Whenever you create a food token, put a 1-1 one, one counter on target creature you control other than Rosy. Oh, so they're like super powerful. Um, but they're only a 1-1, one, one, so you have to try to find a way to keep them alive as long as you can. That's That's pretty crazy. Uh, next up we have Samwise the Stouthhearted. Stouthearted? Wow. Uh, one and a white for a 2-1 legendary creature, human pe halfling peasant, sorry, with flash. When Sa Samwise enters the battlefield, choose up to one target permanent card in your graveyard that was put there from the battlefield this turn. Return it to your hand, then the ring tempts you. So obviously this is kind of like a flavor win, a throwback to, you know, Sam saving Frodo from the brink. Um, great card to play post-combat or after combat on your opponent's turn. Uh, pretty cool. I like that. And then you get the added benefit of the ring tempting you. Second breakfast. There we go. Two and a white for an instant... Up to two target creatures, each get plus two, plus one, until end of turn. Create a food token. Not too bad. Three mana for a combat trick is pretty steep. It's subpar for sure. Um, the creation of the food token is not too bad. The fact that it's only two creatures uh, you control is not that great. But, um, you know, if you needed a combat trick and you were drafting a white X deck, uh, it's not a terrible one so far. Next up, we have Shire Sheriff. One and a white for a 2-2 halfling soldier creature with vigilance. I like their outfit. It's cool. I like whatever, whatever you call these hats. I like those hats. Um, they have vigilance. Whenever Shire Sheriff enters the battlefield, you may sacrifice a token, which is any token. Uh, when you do, exile target creature and opponent controls until Shire Sheriff leaves the battlefield. So for two mana plus... Destroying a token, uh, you get to lock something down. That's pretty good. My throat is like really scratchy and weird right now. Pardon me if I'm hydrating a lot. It's kind of coppery back there. It's not my favorite. Uh, next up, we have Slip on the Ring. Oh, this is a cool little reinterpretation of that scene. Uh, one and a white for an instant exile target creature you own, then return it to the battlefield under your control. The ring tempts you. That's perfect flavor win. Um, having putting on the ring act as a flicker effect is really good. I like that. Kudos to the designers. Soldier of the Grey Host is next. Three and a white for a 2-2 spirit soldier creature with flash and flying. When Soldier of the Grey Host enters the battlefield, target creature gets plus two, plus oh until end of turn. So it's a combat trick attached to a spirit that 
is something that's been done for a very long time. It's really expensive, um, and it's only a plus two plus O, oh, so it's not defensive. It's offensive, um, which kind of feels weird. It just makes it subpar in general. Like it's not strong enough. Next up, we have Stalwarts of Oz Goliath. Four and a white for a 4-3 human soldier creature. When Stalwarts enters the battlefield, the ring tempts you. Okay. Whenever you draw your second card each turn, put a 1-1 one, one counter on Stalwarts. So you want to draw... Um, You want to draw, which is interesting because white is not known for that, but it's it's in it's also inherent in some of its color pairs. So very cool to see them put that on a white card. Uh, next up, we have our first saga, Tale of Tinuvale. Tinuvial, three white white for an enchantment saga. Chapter 1, target creature you control gains indestructible for as long as you control this saga. Chapter 2 is return target creature from your graveyard to the battlefield. Oh, dang. Chapter 3, up to two target creatures you control each gain lifelink until end of turn. So that middle one's pretty good. Um, but the first one and the third one are kind of soft. It also doesn't have read ahead on it. Um, I was kind of, I'm kind of surprised that we're not just continuing with read ahead for the rest of Magic the Gathering. Um, but yeah, I like the sagas. The art on there is really cool. Uh, next up, we have a Took Reaper. One and a white for a 2-1 halfling peasant creature. When Took Reaper dies, the ring tempts you. Pretty simple. Uh, next up, we have another saga, War of the Last Alliance. Three and a white for an enchantment saga. Chapter one, search your library for a legendary creature card, reveal it, put it into your hand. Chapter two, you do the same thing. Chapter three, creatures you control gain double strike until end of turn, and the ring tempts you. So this is like four mana, let's end the game in the next couple of turns, because I'm going to find my two best legendary creatures. Um, pretty cool design. I don't mind it. The, the on turn three on chapter three, like that's the turn you're gonna swing out and try to win. So it's pretty good. Westfold Rider is next. One and a white for a three-one human knight creature. Sacrifice Westfold Rider. Destroy target artifact or enchantment. Activate only as a sorcery. Interesting. I like that. Artifacts or enchantments. That's pretty good. Usually you only get one or the other. Destroy target artifact or destroy target enchantment. This one does either or, um, which is pretty good. It's also a 3-1 for 2 mana, which is a trade I would make pretty much any day. Um, I'd rather have a 3-1 than a 2-2. Two -two. I'd rather have a 1-3 than a 3-1, but I'm not upset at 3-1. Interesting. Next up, we have You Cannot Pass. This is the the most... Maybe not the most. Okay, that's that's a hyperbolic statement. Um, this is like one of the most misquoted lines. Uh, actually, it's not misquoted because in the movie, they changed it for the movie. Um, it's just misattributed. It's specifically a quote from the movies and not a quote from the books. Uh, this is what Gandalf says in the books. A you cannot pass is one white for an instant destroy target creature that blocked or was blocked by a legendary creature this turn. Pretty cool. Nice little flavor win there. They obviously had to play into something to do with this bridge and the Balrog. Um, and so I like that it was it's legendary specific. It had to have blocked or was blocked. Um, so they've had to have partaken in combat at some point. Um, I like that. Next up, we have Frodo Determined Hero. One and a white uh, for a 2-2 legendary creature halfling warrior. 
When Frodo a determined hero enters the battlefield or attacks, you may attach target equipment you control with mana value 2 or 3 to Frodo. As long as it's your turn, prevent all damage that would be dealt to Frodo. Whoa. That's pretty big. Two mana for a 2-2 two -two that can't be dealt damage on your turn. And gets free attach. Uh, if the equipment is mana value 2 or 3, that's pretty good. Um, I know this is like out of alphabetical order, but for some reason there's a handful of cards at the end of the card list. Um, that should have been with the colors. I'm not sure why they're like that. Um, the next one is Gandalf White Rider. This is another one that says, see, this is set number 290. It's a white card. Just put it in with the rest of the white cards. Maybe these were made after the fact. I don't know. We'll never find out. Gandalf White Rider is 3-1 three, three and 1 white for a 3-3 three, three Avatar Wizard legendary creature. With Vigilance, whenever you cast a spell, creatures you control get plus one, plus oh until end of turn, and you get to scry one. Pretty good. Then, when Gandalf the White Rider dies, you may put it into its owner's library fifth from the top. That's pretty cool, so he just keeps coming back if you have that much time. He passed through the fire and the abyss, and the enemy shall fear him. I like I like that. And lastly, in white, we have a knight of the keep. Two and a white for a three-two human knight creature with no abilities, just flavor text. Kind of a weird way to end white. But that's it. Um, looking back, I think... Both of the Frodo cards really intrigue me. This one could be really powerful. Um, the fact that it's basically got indestructible on your turn is really interesting. Um, but I think the other Frodo card, this one is really, really intriguing. I think there's going to be some really fun ways to fast track this third ability where you've got a an end game, an alternate win con kind of coming up ready in the chamber you're ready to go maybe you hold on to this until you have a bunch of mana and the rings already tempted you uh four or more times then you play this level it up attack with it and you win the game or that player loses the game i think it's pretty cool um yeah i like that one the best out of all of the white cards in here I think there's some pretty powerful stuff like the flowering of the white tree is going to be really powerful. Um, what else was there? I think that Bill the Pony is really good. Not just because the art is amazing. I think Dawn of a New Age is really strong. Um, yeah. I like the Dune du Dune Dane Blade. I'm never going to get that right. And I do like Gandalf the White, but that's for my own, like, Azorius controlly purposes. Um, I think that that Frodo... I think Frodo Sauron's Bane is my pick for most interesting uh, white cards from Lord of the Rings, Tales of Middle-Earth. We're going to take a really quick break, use the loo, uh, fill up our water... I chugged a lot of it during that uh, segment. We're going to come back. We're going to jump into blue. So don't go anywhere um, unless you need to stand up and stretch your legs. Then do all that stuff because you deserve it. Take care of yourself. 